Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's panel on handling isolation. So I've been fortunate to chat with over 150 remarkable people on my Intentional Performers podcast. And these people have overcome adversity. They're thought leaders. They think deeply about leadership and how each of us can show up. And they've set up intentional lives for themselves to perform at their best. And the coronavirus has created challenges for so many of us throughout the world. And it's my hope that these panel discussions will help those that are in need. And, and certainly I'm in need. And, and I know the people that are on this panel are also in need. So hopefully we can all learn together. While everyone on the panel has tremendous expertise, I also want to note that what we are going through is truly unprecedented. And there are many questions that maybe the panelists won't have answers to. And, and that's okay. Today's really designed to just be a discussion that will help you learn and, and challenge yourself and grow. Um, so we're not here to answer all your questions. I think it's, it's something that I just wanna say up front, but just get us all to be thinking deeply during this challenging time. So with that, I'd like for each of our panelists to introduce themselves. And we're gonna start with Ethan Zahn, and then we're gonna go to Chris Wilson, and, and then Sam Morris is gonna introduce himself. Thanks for having me. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, my name's Ethan Zahn. I'm a former professional soccer player. And uh, after my time playing soccer, I went on to compete in the reality television show called Survivor. Nice. And I ended up winning Survivor Africa, which was filmed in Kenya. And then I used some of that prize money of a million dollars to co-found a adolescent health organization called Grassroots Soccer. And we are now operating in 60 countries and graduated over 2.7 million kids from the program. And as life would have it, uh, a few years after my time on Survivor, I was diagnosed with a rare form of blood cancer and had to go through multiple rounds of chemotherapy, radiation, and uh, two bone marrow transplants, where I got a lot of my experience at being in isolation. Um, and since my time uh, going through cancer, uh, I am now uh, in remission for about seven years. And lucky enough for me, they are currently airing Survivor season 40, which is called Winners at War, where they brought back 20 of the most popular winners of all time to compete again for not one, but $2 million. And that's airing now, Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. So tune in when you got a chance. Ethan's, Ethan's got his promo down. <laughs> nice. He's got his promo voice down. Right. And, I went into and, like radio host. Oh, it was awesome. <laughs> and uh, no, I love it, Ethan. And, and just to be clear, it's not 40 years of Survivor, it's 40 shows. So you're not... You're not 70 years old by now. You be like Benjamin. <laughs> no, but I am skewing a lot older than some of the other new schools out there. It's, uh, yeah, it's 40th season, 20th year. Awesome. Chris, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. So, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Chris Wilson. I am the author of the book, The Master Plan, which is a story about my life. Um, I spent almost half of my life uh, in prison. I was sentenced to a life sentence as a juvenile. Uh, spent over 117 days in solitary confinement, but while away in prison, I came up with my master plan, which was how to turn my life around using education, studying and entrepreneurship, um, and participating in therapy. And so um, I've been home now for eight years. I'm the owner of several social enterprises based in Baltimore City. I am an interdisciplinary visual artist where I do uh, work short films. Uh, we just got in the Tribeca Film Festival, so I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, I do a lot of painting, so my work can be seen uh, all around the world in museums. Um, and I do a lot of motivational speaking and a lot of advocacy work, particularly on prison education and prison reform. So I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Sam, why don't you take us home? Wow. First of all, let me just say that I am honored to be in the company of such extraordinary people. Um, so I, my name is Sam Morris. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. And um, let's see, a big part of what makes my story interesting is about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago, I had just finished leading a cycling track across the U.S. for nine teenagers. And I uh, was in a car driven by a drunk driver. We went off the road, hit a tree. I became paralyzed from the waist down, and I've been paralyzed from the waist down since then. And um, I dove deeply into mindfulness, meditation, movement practices, breathwork practices, anything that I could find to heal myself both physically and psychologically and emotionally from that experience. 
and uh, ended up uncovering a lot about how high performers can apply these principles and these techniques to their own lives so that they can uh, up-level their own lives, uh, sort of get outside of a, uh, their own limited perceptions of what's possible and overcome seemingly impossible odds. Uh, I've spent over about four years of my life uh, in some form of isolation, uh, two years completely immobilized in hospital beds, and then another two years on bed rest at home uh, due to various different complications from my injury. And so I have a lot of experience with the whole quarantine model of living. And uh, yeah, grateful to be here. So thank you all for, for sharing your, your stories. It's, it's very diverse, but all of you have tremendous experience. And Sam, why don't we just start with you? So you mentioned two years in hospital, two years at home. What did you do during that time to stay productive? Or what was your what were you focused on during those times where you were really bedridden? Gosh, that's a challenging question, but I would say that the main focus was staying sane, uh, which is um, the longest duration that I ever was in a hospital without leaving completely immobilized was seven and a half months. And when I say completely immobilized, like I had to be turned in bed. I had to like they had to lift me up. I couldn't sit up at more than a 15 degree angle even to eat. And so a lot of that time I spent really working on separating myself from my circumstances. Uh, and what I mean by that is this is classic mindfulness uh, work, essentially asking that deep question, who am I? Who am I who is experiencing these circumstances? Um, I am not solely the victim of the circumstances. There's someone in here observing this experience. And the more I can be aware of that observer of the experience, the less the experience has its grips on me and is sort of making me, uh, creating a story about myself being a victim. And so a lot of that time was spent simply in this sort of perpetual state of meditation, whether I was reading, whether I was watching movies, whether I was just sort of watching the clock on the wall and uh, in this state of meditation of observing my experience, but not getting caught up in the mental drama of my experience. And Chris, you mentioned solitary confinement. Yes. Uh, I've read your book. It's fantastic. And just a quick plug for your book. I said to Ethan before we fired up the mics and started recording, I read it in a week and I don't usually read books in a week. So one of my favorite books I've ever written. So thank you for that gift. Thank you. Um, but back to, back to solitary confinement. So Sam mentioned staying sane in bed and uh, right. solitary confinement's designed to really cause you to go insane. So I'm curious for you, what did you do while you were in solitary confinement to try to keep your sanity? So I think a uh, similar, uh, similar attempt at uh, trying to get my mind uh, just kind of focused Unfortunately, I did kind of go crazy uh, after the first like couple of weeks um, in solitary confinement. You kind of go crazy, um, but I developed, you know, mental strength and figured out ways and things that I could do to stay sane, to try to stay in touch with the real world, whether it's thinking about everything that I've been through, what led me to prison, uh, you know, thinking about foreign languages and like my schoolwork and just doing exercise and just trying to create a routine so that I wouldn't go crazy, but uh, it was very, very difficult. And I still sometimes um, battle with the effects of spending time in solitary confinement. So I think in total it was about 118 days I spent in solitary confinement. And I was a juvenile at the time too. So it was, it was pretty, pretty uh, horrible experience. But um, I, I, I jokingly say now with some of my friends who I spent time with now, this is, you know, given the circumstances, one of the best lockdowns that I've been on because, you know, I have access to the internet. I have a Peloton in the house and I have like a, a desk and a library. And it's like all these things that I can do um, to keep my mind moving and, and create some sense of normalcy. Pretty amazing perspective, I think, for all of us to, to have. Ethan, I want to go up to you and uh, you go on this show, Survivor, where they drop you on an island and 
you have to find ways to survive. It's different than what Sam and Chris are talking about because there's other people there and you're competing with them, against them. It's, it's pretty tribal in that nature for those that haven't seen the show. But talk about what it's like to be on the, on the island and to be focused on surviving and, and what that was like for you. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, Survivor's an interesting game. And let's announce again that it is a game <laughs> um, where, you know, it's, you are dropped in a situation with 20 strangers and you got to be friends with these people and friendships based on trust and you can't trust anyone. And the whole point of the game is to be the last person standing to completely isolate yourself amongst everyone else. Um, however, to get to that point, you got to vote people off along the way. Um, so it's a little bit of a, a different mindset, but in, in that situation, it's weird because you, you are surrounded by people, but you've, I personally never felt so alone in your life because you, you literally can't really turn to anyone because all the information you give will be weaponized against you to try to get you out of the show. Um, so that situation, and it was interesting but when you compare that to what i went through with cancer um and like you guys in terms of the isolation after you get a bone marrow transplant you're in the bubble or you're in isolation for 100 days they want you in 100 wow. days, oh, three months um and that but you're in your apartment and the only place i'm going is to and from the hospital and what's interesting for me, which kept me sane, um, and I'm just going to go into exactly what you guys were doing. I was, you know, when I was watching TV or using the internet, doing all that stuff, I was keeping myself in like this almost uh, alternate state of meditation. Uh, and I, I agree with that. And I would, like a tip that I use is I would literally create a minute by minute schedule for myself while I was in isolation um, in the sense that wake up, do my emails, call my mom, read the paper, exercise, eat, like hundreds of things. And I would check them off all day long for the time when I got to the end of the day, I'd look back and i say, oh, I was in isolation. I felt like I did nothing today, but I really did a hundred of these things. And emotionally and mentally, it just made me feel a lot more productive and a lot more useful in the world that I was now living in. And that was just one of the tips that I personally used to get through each day while I was in isolation. Ethan, I'm going to ask a little question. mini goals along the way is what I helped get through one day. Ethan, I'm going to ask you a question, but it's actually going to, I'm curious to get Chris and, and Sam, your perspective on the same question, which is none of you would have chosen to get cancer or Chris to go into solitary confinement. Um, Chris, your story is even more complicated as far as how you end up in prison and what leads to that. Uh, and then Sam, you know, I'm sure don't wish that you were um, paralyzed and Sam lived a very active life before, <laughs> before, the, before and after uh, being paralyzed. But being in those spaces of isolation, a lot of people now are isolated, but it's not their choice. The people are saying you have to be isolated for your own health and for the health of our communities. So Ethan, I'll start with you as, as you came out of that experience and had set up these mini goals and have started to get organized with how you were doing things. How did that translate once you became healthy again? And so it's the same question. I'm curious for Chris, once, once you came out and even entered the general population, how it impacted you and, and, and then even out of jail and Sam, same thing. I'm curious how the isolation impacted you, even though it's not something that I'm sure you wish happens to your, your worst enemy. I'm curious to, what what benefits came from that time where you developed those processes? I think one of the interesting things about go, what's going on right now in the world is that none of us chose the condition we are put into, um, and none of us are choosing this corona thing. However, the one difference I think is like when you get cancer, it's a pretty uh, it happens to you. And no one's going to know what my experience going through cancer is like unless you go through it. And everyone experience going through cancer is different than my own. The one good thing, if you can say, about coronavirus is we're all going through the same thing at the same time, right? So you can communicate with other people. You can talk to other people. You can share what's going on. I'm isolated. My friend got sick. Um, I'm taking care of this person. Like when you go through cancer or you're injured in an accident, or you're in solitary, you're, it's just you. Like it's you and yourself and your brain and your ruminating thoughts, which is often the thing that would 
derail people from staying sane. But I think what's great and beautiful about what's going on right now is we are all going through the same thing at the same time. We're all in this together. We all need each other to make this virus go away by staying home or taking precautions. So I think that's something that's, com that's interesting about this situation. The pandemic is for everyone. Each one of us went through our own individual things and no one's gonna know what that's like. Uh, but coming on the other end of it, getting to a point where I was mentally, physically, and spiritually strong enough to get into public and start communicating and talking with people and getting back in the world, I mean, I was definitely shell-shocked. Um, there's a lot of invisible scars and uncertainty in your life when you're just resurrecting yourself uh, from the ashes, you know, to come out and, and present yourself as a new person. And I recently learned um, in Hebrew, uh, the word for a challenge and the word for a miracle share the same root word, which is ness. And that's because when life throws you challenges, it brings out miraculous things in us. And, you know, these challenges that we're all facing aren't supposed to beat us down, but rather the opposite. They're supposed to empower us, build us up, make us stronger as individuals and as a community to go out there and do some incredible things in the world. So I found the most helpful thing for me in the middle of my nightmare was if I could help other people. You know, if somehow I could rationalize this horrible situation that occurred to me, cancer, um, and turn that around and use this diagnosis and this crisis in my life to educate other people, to share the details of my life, to help someone else going through a similar situation, really helped me as a human being. It helped heal me. So I encourage everyone who's going through a bad time, if you can somehow structure your, your focus and focus on other people in the middle of your own situation, it kind of uh, buffers what's going on. It helped me feel better about myself, rationalize what was going on. This was my purpose now to use this to help others. And I think um, looking at everyone's background, it might be something similar we're all facing when we went through these challenges. A lot of, a lot of heads nodding, and I'm going to come to Sam and Chris in a minute. But you said something that I, I, it got me thinking, Ethan, which is, all right, so you come out of cancer, and now you're thinking about being in service to others. Uh, when you won Survivor and you won a million dollars and you're now famous, right? And people are recognizing you. You, you're, you have that, whether it's 15 minutes or whatever, but I'm like- still stretching out, it's 20 years later. Stretching it, right? <laughs> but, but I'm curious what your mindset was when you, when you got off that island and you had won and you had you know, been looked at in a certain way and maybe revered or, or people may have been in awe versus when you had- um, come out of cancer and you sort of talked about not sure how you want to interact with the world. Can you compare and contrast those? Yes. I mean, one, you're competing for a million dollars. One, you're competing for your life, <laughs> cancer and survivor. However, with survivor, I played the game in Kenya. And while I was playing the game of survivor, I won one of those reward challenges, what I'm sure everyone's heard about. I won these two goats. I took these goats to this village where I visited a hospital and I ended up playing soccer, hacky sack, with all these children in the middle of this village, couldn't speak the same language, yet we're communicating through the sport that we both love. And later I found out all these kids I was playing soccer with at this hospital, they were HIV positive. So here I was in the middle of this game, this cutthroat game of Survivor, and I had that real life experience. And for me, it just did not connect where I was playing a game for a million bucks, pretending to be surviving an African world, realize people are suffering. So that's what inspired me to use the platform, the 15 minutes of fame and the money that I won to co-found this charity. So that was that whole side of it. Um, and then, you know, you just with the can whole cancer thing, similar situation, I made the choice to make my battle public um, because I wanted to help other people out there. And once again, it was, I just had a great platform being in the public eye. Um, the one thing that I guess was something I learned along the way is I presented a really succinct, positive, happy-go-lucky guy to the world. Meanwhile, on the inside, I was a complete mess total war of the world. So I do public speaking engagements and say, have a positive attitude and you're going to beat this and the world's going to be all happy. And then my mom called me. She's like, Ethan, that's not really what's going on. Tell people what's really going on. And then that's when people are going to connect with you and listen to you and your authenticity is going to shine through. 
And once my mom told me that, I went out there and saying, listen, like, it's good to be positive, but I have fucking horrible days. I can't get out of bed. I'm crying. I'm throwing up. I'm pissing on myself. That's what cancer's really like. And when I did that, things shifted. And I started presenting an authentic version of myself and kind of not being afraid of what the public was going to do or judge me because I was pretending to be awesome, but I was really not. And that just did not, that did not mesh. So I changed my strategy and became more authentic, honest, truthful, the good and the bad. And I think that was a huge turning point in my trajectory, I guess. And Chris, your book was real. I mean, you don't sugarcoat. I mean, some of the stuff, I felt every emotion when I read your book, um, sadness, frustration, anger, fear. Um, And you talk about stuff happening to your mom in the book, seeing things in your neighborhood. And you talk about, taking someone else's life. I mean, this is right. not some, to Ethan's point, this wasn't a game. This is right. this was very real. And uh, authenticity was definitely a piece of the puzzle for your book. Um, but, but back to sort of once you're, um, you get, to me, there's like two big transitions. They're talking about solitary confinement and then going back into general population in jail where you right. were able to create a lot of amazing, you created businesses while you were in jail. You learned languages. Absolutely. You did some incredible stuff while in jail. But then there's this other transition of back into the real world, which for you was not so clean. There was halfway house, there's, there's elements, but give some people the perspective of those transitions of right. severe isolation to not having your freedom being in jail to halfway house to eventually, you know, the freedom that, that you have now. Right. Um, so like, again, in my book, I talk a lot about what I went through and I felt it was important to write the book and tell my story because Uh, we often don't hear what young people experience before they end up committing a crime and get swept up in the criminal justice system. And so I felt it was important to talk about that. A lot of gun violence, you know, for example, my mom and I were attacked uh, by a police officer and my mom was raped in front of me by a police officer. They stalked our family. I lost friends to gun violence. So all of this early um, childhood trauma that I experienced, and then, you know, some men came after me and I ended up taking a person's life. And now I'm in prison. And it's like being teleported to another planet. You know, I was 118 pounds, uh, you know, 17 years old, and I'm in a maximum security adult prison. And so it was a, a bit of a culture shock there. And then to be, to experience solitary confinement, um, there was a lot of trauma that I had to deal with. And like Ethan, um, who mentioned invisible scars. And so that's something that I carry even to this day. And, but having spent time in solitary confinement and after, you know, a decade in prison of like self-improvement and going through all kinds of crazy stuff uh, behind the fence, um, I took some of those experiences that I survived and kind of developed like a mental toughness and sort of a, a sense of urgency because I would see, you know, some people would commit suicide in prison or some people would be on solitary confinement for years and years and years. And so as I started, um, I, and I went to college when I was in prison. So while I was in college, it was a way for me um, to, to leave prison mentally. And so I started uh, just, you know, one, feeling a little ashamed of myself for like having me and swept up in the system, uh, but then also being inspired um, through uh, education of saying like, when I do have a second chance, if I have a second chance, I call it a positive delusion. So I believe that I would have a chance to be free again. I, I told my, I promised myself, that I will always move with a sense of urgency. And so going through all these, these um, crazy experiences um, kind of prepared me for the situations like we face today where we, it's, it's uncertain. We don't know how long we'll have to be um, in this, this solitary um, sort of state. Um, but I've, I've been practicing the things that I've learned uh, in prison um, and, and, and going through all these challenging uh, past experiences of just like remaining optimistic uh, reaching out to loved ones, um, just like structuring my day and just, you know, I guess most importantly, just having faith that like things will be better. So it just allows me like to get through. And Positive Delusion is a great transition over to Sam and Sam's company is called Zen Warrior. And uh, when, when we chatted on the podcast, Sam, it was really interesting to hear about the part of you that's a warrior and the part of you that's very Zen. Um, but talk about for you, uh, once the reality hit that it's like, all right, I'm not going to walk again, but I can still do so much. And once again, give people some perspective on what you do for a living and um, how you 
still stay active and uh, live your life in a very intentional way. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it, it feels like something that's common for all of us here is that our lives have forced us, maybe especially during these moments of isolation, to kind of chip away at the illusions of, you know, what we think life is supposed to be and to find that core uh, that is who we are, uh, that, is, that is outside of those illusions. And what I mean by that is we take for granted the fact that we live these lives of expectation. We expect that our planes are going to be on time. We expect that our food is going to be on the table at a time when we want it to be on the table. We expect that paycheck to be arriving when we think it's going to be arriving. And when that doesn't happen, when those expectations aren't met for whatever reason, suddenly we have to face the fact that it's just us and those expectations. We, and that we are, and, and, and the, the question to me always is, well, who is it in there that's expecting things to be a certain way? And who is it that is so troubled right now when things aren't a certain way? So underneath all of those expectations, we can find the creator of the expectations. And that creator of the expectation is actually our true selves. So it feels like to me something common with all of us is we've been forced in a way through the circumstances of our lives, creating certain uh, conditions to find what that essence actually is that is independent of the expectations. And I think a lot of the challenge that comes in for people, and I'm sure a lot of the people watching this right now, is they're like, hey, my routine has been disrupted. Life is not what I expected it to be, and it's freaking me out right now. And, and I'm spending way too much time in my head ruminating, and I don't know what's going on, and it's creating conflict inside of me. And I would say, use that as an opportunity. Use that as an opportunity to discover what's underneath all of those expectations because who is really in there is your true self. And the more you can kind of let go of those expectations, the more you can find that, that stillness inside of you. And that stillness of, inside of you is incredibly resilient. And that's why I call what I do Zen warrior training, because it's helping people to discover that space of stillness inside of them, that center, and then operate from that place and take on the battles of life from their center, which is exactly the same way that samurai uh, were always taught in the past. The ancient samurai were taught this inner stillness, finding that center, essentially die to yourself while you're still living so that you can let go of any kind of expectation and show up totally present to go about the battles of life from a space of total presence. I mean, yeah, yeah. that was awesome, dude. <laughs> Mind blown. Like, <laughs> of, like all the things that I went through, like, you just basically, I don't know. I need to follow you around a little bit longer. I think. <laughs> but, you know, it made me think, cause like, and sorry to make this all about me, but no, please. on Survivor, like I purposely put myself in a situation where you're forced to grow, I guess, as you respond to some of these weird things they put you through. But, but what I was totally unexpected was the loneliness and isolation of being stuck in the middle of Africa, no friends, no family, no Wi-Fi, nothing. Like all I had with me were the clothes on my back, right? And once you take away food and you take away water and you're tired, you're hungry, you're thirsty, like, like you said, like your, your true colors come into focus. Like I was stripped down to who I was at my core. And what was left was whatever was on the inside. And for me, I, like it got back to the way I was playing the game and the way I played my life, but just like character, kindness, perseverance. Those were the three things that I felt, you know, spilled out of me when I had nothing else. Um, and then when you go through something like a health challenge or jail or, or cancer, similar thing, you're stripped down to who you are as your core. Like all you have left is what's on the inside because nothing else matters. You just want to stay alive or get out of jail or, you know, 
get your life back on your feet. So I really appreciate what you just said. That was enlightening to me. So thank you. That was awesome. Amen. Thank you for that reflection. And it, it's actually, if I could combine what both of you were saying, Ethan, you're talking about finding your authenticity after cancer and telling the truth. And Sam, you're talking about this exploration to who you are. As you're doing that exploration in isolation, talk about the dark side of that and you know some of the uh, stuff that comes up when you're doing that exploration because as people are in isolation and exploring themselves, they might not always like what they find as they strip themselves down. So can you sort of talk about your own experience and maybe some of the dark sides or the downsides to exploring? Are you asking me? Yeah, Sam. Yeah, yeah. Um, boy, yeah. No, it's true. Um, you know, there's a lot underneath the surface. And I think that's what makes a lot of us afraid to go inside. And it's also what makes meditation so challenging for people. You know, people will spend five minutes in meditation and be like, I can't stand this. You know, <laughs> and then, and so people are perpetually looking to find external distractions to prevent themselves from going inside. Because when we go inside, we really have to deal with some inner demons. We have to deal with some really gnarly stuff. And um, part of what I've learned about that stuff is to not take it personally, not make it about me per se what we're dealing with when we go inside, when we go into that, those unconscious places inside of ourselves, when we're forced to do that, or when we choose to do that intentionally, and we have to deal with those dark forces, those inner demons, whatever we want to call them, they're part of the collective unconscious. They're part of the human experience. They are not about us as individuals. And that's the thing that I've really had to unwind myself because it's easy when you start to go into that space to be like, man, what is wrong with me? Like, am I just a horrible person? Do like, what is, what is all this nasty, murky, dark stuff inside? And the fact of the matter is, it's not about who we are as people. It's about the collective unconscious that we are all connected to. And, you know, this is stuff that, um, this is uh, Carl Jung speaks to a lot of this stuff around the collective unconscious and what we are all connected to together. And so separating myself as an individual from that dark space inside, which is part of the collective human psyche is uh, something that I've found essential in maintaining one's sanity as one does this inner exploration. And Chris, I'm, I'm curious to get your perspective on all this. There's a part in the book where you talk about they brought in a, a woman who had lost their, her child um, yeah. to a very awful crime and how you, you recognize that most people in jail were actually good people who had gotten caught right. up in a bad environment. But there were people that perhaps yeah. were lost, where they were gone. Um, but for you, as you're exploring yourself and spending a lot of quiet time. You talk about also therapy and you mentioned therapy earlier today. So talk about that fight, that, that inner fight that you're going through between your own good and your own evil and exploring who you are and, and how you want to show up. Right. Uh, so for my first six years of incarceration, um, and that's how six years is how long it took for me to genuinely understand what the what remorse meant um because like for example like in my crime like i was 17 years old some men came after me or whatever i happened to have a gun on me i didn't end up taking a person's life and for those first couple of years i felt like well i didn't start it i didn't go after these people like they came after me and so it was tough for me to genuinely be remorse remorseful and until six years later when I had this therapy session, it was a victim's impact group. And it was a woman who was talking about what it's like to be a victim of a crime. And she started with like, her car was stolen. And I was like, well, people were like, well, you got insurance, you get a new car. She was like, I had to pay like a deductible and all this stuff, I didn't have it. And she told me a story about how her daughter was, um, was attacked and like, and just like brutally murdered. And I remember how I felt 
when she was telling me this. And I was like, I, I could never do something like this to another human being. And she says, these people who done this to my daughter were monsters like you guys. And so when I was transferred back to the housing unit after this, this um, therapy session, there were guy, actual guys who were in the group who were laughing about it and was like, I would have done it or whatever. And so it was at that moment I realized that there were monsters in prison, right? Some, some people in here are monsters. Um, but then something changed inside of me where I had to really like accept responsibility for what I did. I knew that I wasn't a monster. And so from that moment going forward, um, I had to demonstrate to myself and to everyone else in the world that my life was redeemable, um, that I was a good person. And I did that mostly through my actions. But it was at that incident that kind of like changed me. Um, I had to accept some, some dark realities. Like I committed a crime. I didn't want to. I was fearing for my life. But like it just doesn't matter. I had to accept it. And that helped me to move forward in therapy to talk about um, things that led up to me even wanting to carry a gun. And that helped me move forward in life by addressing like my dark past and things that I experienced. So that's something, you know, I mentioned therapy earlier. That's something why it's super important to embrace the therapy, especially in the African-American community. We have this stigma of like, if you go to therapy, then you know, something's wrong with you. Um, but I, I look at it as a, the opposite. I mean, obviously I can't go to my therapy sessions now, but I do a call, I do the same thing, um, Zoom call with my therapist once a week. Um, she gives me advice, um, and I just think, you know, you know, my experiences in the past have allowed me to get through what we're going through now, um, for the most part, positively. Knocking on wood, because who knows when this is going to end. <laughs> and Chris, you mentioned earlier that this is different than the isolation that you had in jail. And uh, right. a little more on Chris, your family didn't, you know, really come visit you much. You were, right. you didn't have people coming and you actually befriend somebody in prison whose family did come and they become right. your, your family in, in a way. Uh, so talk about connection and yeah. this idea that we do have the ability, like right now, look at what we're doing. The four right. of us are, are together. And if it wasn't for this thing, I would have interviewed each of you individually, which I've done, but I never right. would have brought you together for this discussion, which is, which is just mind blowing to me, but um, connection. Let's talk about connection a little bit. The opposite right. of maybe isolation and, and how you're Chris, how you're leveraging connection right now right. and, um, how much appreciation maybe you have for connection. Right. Uh, talk about that a bit. So, so I'm glad you brought that up um, because I, I can't help but to compare like this experience with past experience of like not having almost any um, human contact or just like the uncertainty of like, you know, eating like horrible food. And so here we are now um, in this crazy uh, situation. However, we have all these resources at our disposal, right? We have like the internet. We can like, we can, FaceTime with family members and like the way I see like this whole um, situation we're in as a big reset and I've been, I've been encouraging my friends and family members to look at it like you know some of my friends are like losing their mind because you know, it seems like the world's coming to an end but it's like at the end of the day most of us are going to survive this so how do we make the best of this time that we have available right and so for me is um, creating like you know strict structure of like my studies and I'm thinking about like who I am and as a, as a person or um, in my book how I say um, what's my end game and so I have goals and stuff that I want to work on and so um, I think it was um, was was it um, Ethan that was saying like writing up a, like a, a minute by minute like schedule and it's like everything that I want to work on and when you check those, check those off just like on my master plan there's a sense of accomplishment of like I check this off I finished this book, I'm gonna move on to this book. And I'm doing like an hour of YouTube videos and learning stuff and I'm zooming and checking in on my team and my employees. And at the end of the day, you know, I just, I feel good and I feel like it wasn't a day wasted. And so I've been like kind of making fun of some of my, my friends, like don't spend all day eating food and watching Netflix and gaining weight and all that. Let's, let's stay like focused and we're gonna come out of this better. And so that's what I would encourage people to do, like use this as an opportunity to reset your life. And Sam, I want to just kick it back to you because I love this idea of the tension between being and becoming. And so being what you talked about, the stillness and what you can find out when you're being or practicing meditation or, or mindfulness or whatever you're doing to be, 
And there's something really valuable in that space, whether you're journaling or, or just sitting with your thoughts and being. And then what Chris is really talking about, and Ethan too, this idea of like, what can I be doing? How can I keep my mind busy and productive and becoming and learning and growing and developing and painting or you know, speaking or, re or reading or whatever I'm doing to, to grow? For you, Sam, how do you navigate the elements of being and becoming? And how do you think about that? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Well, in that in that state of being, to me, what that is is it's it's presence is also emergence. If we want to look at it that way, so the more present I am, the more I am aware of the fact that I am perpetually in a state of growth and creativity. <laughs> so, if I'm present, I realize I'm not my past. I also realize I'm not my anxieties about the future. I'm simply here right now. And the more I am here right now, the more I am attuned to what nature is doing. And nature is perpetually growing. Nature is perpetually creating. So from that space of being, I'm always becoming because this present moment is now gone. Now I'm in this present moment. Now I'm in this present moment. Now if I can follow that with my awareness and track that inside of myself, and stay calm and centered inside of myself, I naturally am gonna to wanna to create. I'm naturally gonna to wanna to grow. I'm naturally gonna to wanna to keep moving the needle forward from an inspired place. Not from a place of have to's and expectations and so forth, but from an inspired place of creativity. So those two things are not mutually exclusive at all. They actually have this beautiful complementary relationship with each other. The more I am connected to my being, my present moment being, the more I'm also connected to what is always in emergence, which is always what is always developing, what's always growing new roots and growing new leaves and sprouts and so forth. So, you know, after this call, I'm going to be inspired naturally to do whatever is going to be cultivating my next expression of myself in the world, whatever that is. And so, you know, and, and, and that alignment also, that goes across board, whether it's um, connecting with people, family, whether it's work, whether it's nutrition, everything comes from a more inspired place when we are connected to that present moment being. And Ethan, as you're hearing Sam talk, I'm just curious to get your, your thoughts on, on your perspective on, on what he's talking about. Yeah, no, I found it very helpful. And uh, it's interesting to hear all you guys speak about your strategies and tips on getting through these moments, because I think we're all doing similar things, just structuring it differently with our own language. And, you know, what you said about being present, it's interesting because, you know, post-cancer for me was actually a more difficult journey than going through cancer. I mean, when a doctor tells you to do something or you'll die, you pretty much do it, right? There's really no choice. Do this take your chemo, radiation, or you'll die, fine. But when you're after cancer, when you are all of a sudden, have all this anxiety about the cancer coming back, you don't know what your life is gonna look like, uh, you don't feel good, you don't look good, all these things, for me, um, I started ruminating um, on these negative thoughts, these, these horrible situations, and I would call them the what-if scenarios, what if I die? What if the cancer comes back? What if I never get married? What if I don't, you know, have a job? And I feel maybe this, and I, what happened was I was paralyzed. I literally could not move forward in my life. I could not even think about the future. I was just stuck in what happened and my anxiety that it may happen again. And I wasn't living. And so I call them the what if scenarios. My wife and I created this technique where I would take in that what if, let's go, what if I, what if the cancer comes back? Let's play this game. What if the cancer comes back? Okay, well, I acknowledge it. I take it in. I think of the worst possible situation if the cancer comes back, but then I would take a piece of paper and I would literally write down the plan of action for if the cancer did come back. Uh, I call the doctor, I get chemo, I call my mom, I do X, Y, and Z, and I put it on the piece of paper, then I filed it away. And now if I started having those thoughts again of what if I cancer comes back, I can go to this file and I know what I'm going to do because I already wrote it down. And that freed me from this loop I was on and I could be present and I could move on, put it away because I know what I know what I'm going to do because I wrote it down and it's ready to go. And I give the example to people that like, 
I could walk out the door and get hit by a car tomorrow. It's, it's, it, it would happen. It's, it's, a, it's a long shot, but it could happen. But if I spent every minute of every day thinking about the idea of me walking out the house and getting hit by a car, like I just wasted that entire day. So I don't want to live through his experience multiple times. So think about it, write down your plan of action, file it away and move on with your life or your day. And I would have to, I mean, I have boxes full of post-it notes with plans and everything of what's going to happen, but I did it. And at, over time, it started getting less and less and less. And now I know if I have these, what it's an error, I go to the file box, I pick it out. Oh, I already figured it out. Put it away. Move on. Yeah. Something I'm on that right there. I like that. <laughs> That's super cool. I like that a lot. <laughs> There's something powerful but also about writing it down and getting rid of yeah. it. There's some science around the power of writing things down and, and then moving on from it. And Sam, Ethan used the word paralyzed in that there were times, no, no, I think it's, I think it's beautiful. Like, um, and he said, feeling paralyzed. And I actually think a lot of people right now are feeling paralyzed. They, they are being told they can't go work out at the gym or they're telling they can't go to their office or they have to be around their kids. Like it, it feels, it feels like uh, it, it's, it's paralyzing or they can't work or they're laid off or they can't say certain things. And so I think Americans, a big part of our culture is freedom. And we talk about freedom nonstop and our country is founded on this idea of freedom. But you actually had something stripped from you, taken away from you. And, and it's different than Chris and Ethan in that they are now, you guys have your, your scars, but you said they're sort of like more, you can't see them and you can still develop a relationship with them. But for Sam, you, you still remain paralyzed. So I'm curious for you when, when you hear that word, what, what comes up for you? What, how, do you? how do you hear that and think about it? And how do you think about people that feel paralyzed in their situation right now? Well, for one thing, I totally get it. And, um, you know, and I would say, first of all, I want to start by saying that I still experience paralysis in my own life, despite the fact that I do what I do and that I have the philosophy that I do and that I live the way that I live. In fact, a big part of why I coach other people is so that I can keep reminding myself of these principles and techniques to get me through my own paralysis. And, you know, the, the more I, by processing those feelings around the paralysis, what I've come to realize, and I realized this intellectually very early on, but it took a long time to begin to embody it more and more and more, that my actual physical paralysis is really nothing more than a big inconvenience. It means that there are certain doors I can't get through. There's, it's going to mean that there's um, stairs that I have to negotiate. It means that you know there are a number of things that come along with that condition uh, health issues, um, you know, soreness of shoulders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list is, it's a long list. However, if I really look at it for what it is, it's really just a lot of inconveniences. It's really not paralysis. And the only thing that can actually ever be paralysis is this feeling of a feeling. It's a feeling of being stuck. And so if I am able to separate and go, okay, this is inconvenience, but this is not stuck. My energy is not stuck. Energy doesn't get stuck. Energy can only get stuck if my expectations of what reality was supposed to be in my mind are not uh, in alignment with what is actually happening in reality. So that's the only thing that could ever get me in a state of paralysis if, is if there's a misalignment between my expectations and what is occurring in reality. So what I've learned how to do a lot is drop my expectations and show up in the present moment without the expectations. And when I do so, I'm always seeing the openings versus the blocks. So for those who are going through some really challenging times right now, and I get there's a lot of people, you know, both with disruption of work, some people maybe not having a job anymore, there's going to be a process of having to deal with the fact that you've created a reality around your expectations and reality does not conform to expectations. And 
And now it's going to be time to make a shift, to, to, to make that shift and get that energy keeps flowing. Things keep moving. Life does not stop. And so to whatever degree you feel like life has stopped, it's because there's a mismatch between expectations and reality. And the more we can be present in reality, the more we can start to see the openings and opportunities that we might not have been able to look at. But I want to say along with that, don't use that as a spiritual bypass because it could be really easy to just try to think positively, think positively and end up not actually dealing with the emotions of that loss of your expectations. Because that's another important component is actually dealing with the frustration and the grief and the, the anger that things didn't work out the way that you wanted them to. And so, uh, and that's something that I've been guilty of in the past, using sort of a spiritual bypass of positive thinking to try to put myself in a perception that I've moved on when I actually hadn't moved on. And so, and, and Ethan spoke to this earlier in terms of, you know, rah, 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 think positively. In the meantime, you're going through all of this stuff emotionally inside. So it's important to also acknowledge those heavy, dark emotions as well in this process. And to get at the same time, life will not stop. Life does not stop. And if we can actually process and let go of the expectations that we had that life was supposed to look a certain way, we can actually access a certain creative potential that we don't even know is there. There's a, there's a theme that I'm hearing that I just want to bring our attention to. And Chris, I'm, I'm going to put you on deck here because I want to get your perspective <laughs> on this. So we've got illusions that, Sam, I think you brought up this idea of we put these illusions and these stories in our head. Chris talked about delusions and, and being positively delusional in a, in a good way. And Chris wasn't supposed to get out. He had a life sentence and got out after 16 years in part because of his own delusions um, and his own beliefs that he was going to continue to try to make it happen, make it happen. Even when the system and society was saying, there's no way, bro, like just make your life in prison and, and that's it. So you've got positive delusion, you've got illusion. And then Sam, I love what you were just hitting on, which is reality. Like the idea that there's also a reality. And, and so Chris, one of the things I'm curious to get your perspective on is you had your reality, which was you're in jail for life. You're not getting out, but you stayed positively delusional. And now as you sit here, we weren't going to be able to have this conversation if you didn't have that positive delusional mindset. It wasn't going to happen. Right. And I can't emphasize enough what Chris is doing. I mean, he's got amazing paintings. He's got businesses. He has a nonprofit. The dude is living, man. He is <laughs> flat out. He has a Corvette. You still have <laughs> That's right. Like, like it's in, it, like it's incredible, and there's something called people are familiar with uh, PTSD, positive traumatic stress disorder, um, and all of you have gone through trauma in your life. And it's not we don't do degrees of trauma. Someone's trauma is their own experience and their own trauma. Right. But there's also something called positive growth, and there's been research around when people go through trauma, they have this expedited growth that can take place if they step into that experience and that opportunity to grow. And Chris, when I look at your life, I see this person who has gone through so much trauma and it's real, like, like that's reality. It's not, yeah. it's not an illusion, like this is real stuff. And then you've leveraged this positive delusion to grow at a clip that is just unbelievable. And so I'd love for you to talk about the growth and once right. out of isolation, once in the real world, how you've stepped into that growth, because I'd love to learn from you because honestly, I'm just blown away by it. Well, th thank you for, um, for saying that. And I, like, honestly, I, you know, back when I was younger and doing like my, my positive delusion uh, state, which is like spanned it for about, um, a little over a decade, about 14, 15 years. Um, it was all about, you know, um, achieving my goals and, and, and trying to make stuff happen. And I was accomplishing things. But as I got older, like I'm 41 now, and a few years ago, one of the things that really like lit me up, um, and I think a few of you guys mentioned this today, was uh, acts of service. 
And so at a certain point, like, you know, I bought a new house, I bought all my cars that I ever wanted, and I was traveling the world and everything. And after a while, it wasn't just about like accomplishing things and doing things just for myself, my life. And this happened to me at a point in prison when I write about when my mentor was like, you know, you just graduated school, but think about everyone else. And so when I started uh, just helping other people out on the inside and on the outside, like the blessings um, came back to me tenfold. And so that's something like, you know, when I ask people like, what gets you out the bed in the morning? What drives you? It's, a, it's an act of service. Like, you know, money and financial uh, stuff like that, that's, not, that's a bad motivator, right? We should have it. You know, financial independence is something that I wrote on my master plan. But being able to help other people and not expect anything in return is something that really um, drives me. Um, and I, I, I uh, will say is a, um, a, a, a really good sign of growth within myself. Because, you know, even in business deals, you know, I define myself as a social entrepreneur. It's not just about money. It's not just about the deal. It's like, how does this make people's lives better? How does this make the environment better? And if, if I can't, like, answer those questions, I don't do business. And so um, when it comes to growth, it just, my experiences have changed me. And so growth to me is just trying to make the world better, a little better than it was yesterday. And every action that I, that I um, engage in, I try, to, I try to keep that in the back of my mind. And so... That's been my growth experience. And even now, like just trying to support folks. A lot of people I know had to lay off their employees. Um, my cousin just got fired. Like I'm cash out the money. It's just all kinds of stuff that's going on. Um, but I'm happy to do it. Like this is what drives me. Sam, you're, you're lit up. for the. So you've been pretty stoic. Uh, and and I'm, I'm like watching you. And it's like very grounded and centered and just present. But while Chris was talking, I couldn't help but notice you you're start smiling. And Ethan, now you're, you're smiling as well. So Sam and, and then Ethan, I'm curious to get your perspective on what Chris is talking about. Well, I was just thinking the whole time, the t- what Chris is talking about right now, there's a lot of lip service given by a lot of people in the personal development world to exactly what Chris is speaking of. And I just want to point out to the, the, your audience our audience that Chris has lived it. That this is this is not lip service. This is evidence of the power of this type of um, engagement with the world. And I want to speak to it in two different ways. First of all, the power of putting service ahead of money. Huge, right. yes. absolutely huge. And I also want to speak to the power of what we've been calling positive delusion you know what chris is speaking to right now with the positive delusion it's exactly what um dr joe dispenza speaks to when he talks about accessing the quantum field of possibility and what he speaks to is matching a an intention with a feeling and what i'm hearing that chris did is essentially he spent what we're t- what we're causing what we're calling positive delusion actually wasn't a delusion at all. He spent years cultivating a relationship between his mind and his feeling sense until that reality had no choice but to become his reality. He he actually created his future by connecting to the feelings that he wanted to connect to, and this is what I'm I'm guessing you did, was you kept connecting to the feelings that you wanted in the future, and you connect, kept connecting to your intention mentally of what it would take to get to those feelings so that you could be living like that. And reality literally had to conform to your your new intention because you put yourself in that place so solidly that you became the reality, you became the future self that you had been planting the seeds of all of those years. And I would say, man, that is showing such a level of mastery. And, you know, I want everyone who's listening to this to follow Chris's lead with this, connecting to that feeling and connecting with that intention, no matter what you're going through, just keep creating that future self because if you do, reality will conform to to that what was previously an illusion but eventually becomes reality and so that's very different from having a bunch of expectations that reality is supposed to conform 
to uh, to what we think it should be. Instead, what Chris did was he did it from the inside out versus from the outside in. Awesome, Ethan. That's true law of attraction work. That's right. That is, that is true law of attraction work. What you what you did. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree with that. And you know, I'll make a I'll take an example, and I, I don't know if this is similar or not, but you know, the best way to predict your future is to create it. And that's a little right. bit of what you were saying. So I guess when I was on Survivor, I was visual in, I was visualizing myself at that final travel council winning a million bucks. Right. Now, you know, there's it's 39 days to get there and I had to do stuff along the way, but that was my end goal. With cancer, I had a visualization board that I would look at every night before I went to bed imagining what it's like when I'm healthy, running a marathon, eating fresh food, hanging out with people again, you know, um, making some money, writing a book. Like I had this all on a board. I'd look at it every single night before I went to bed. Cause in my mind, I'm like, if I die in my sleep, at least like I have some good thoughts. And if I wake up in the morning, at least I know, uh, I'll have, you know, I've thought about this stuff and it's, a, it's a way it's my future. It's where I want to be. It's what I'm projecting in myself and as Chris was saying, or Sam was saying, creating the reality around my delusional thoughts of being healthy and successful again after cancer, and I guess creating that along the way. Um, so I think that that's a very good tip. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I firmly believe in that. And obviously the whole phil philanthropic side, every single person here has made the choice to share our story. You know, we could have kept this all inside, which was fine, but we're sharing it hopefully to help other people, but it's helping ourselves along the way. Um, you know, service over self, you know, money is not as important as helping other people out there. Um, so I think it's all really interesting theories here. And, and I'm going to start winding us down, but I actually believe that when you're in service, the other stuff also comes. So there's a great book, Give and Take by Adam Grant, where he found that givers are actually, they make more money than, than takers do. And it's actually a nice segue for this, which is the whole idea of this is to just be in service and to help give insight to amazing people and the three of you are superheroes that don't wear capes and are normal as well i think this idea that a superhero has to be some extraordinary human i think what's inside of you is inside all of us but you've been tested and uh through that test it's just been remarkable and inspiring to learn how you all are handling it what i'd like to do is give you the floor to either ask each other a question um or provide insight into those who are isolated right now. So you can either ask one of the other people here a question that you're just curious about, or can provide insight into, um, if you were, some of you had talked about talking to family members and friends about that are going through isolation right now and advice that you give or questions you'd ask. Um, so, so I'm gonna give the floor and Sam, we'll start with you, then we'll go to Chris and then we'll end with Ethan. Sam, do you have a question for either of these guys that you're curious about, or is there any insight that you would want to leave the people that are listening to this conversation? That's a great question. You know, um, I, I guess one question, and I could ask both of you this question, because um, I get asked this a lot. I, I, I frequently hear, well, what, what was that moment when you just kind of knew, uh, you know, what was the moment when the shift began to happen? And I'm never able to identify exactly one moment um, when a shift uh, sort of mentally or emotionally began to happen that put me in on the trajectory that I am on right now. But is there a moment or, 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 and I'll ask, uh, I'll start with you, Chris. Is there a moment? Was there an insight? Was there something specific that happened? Or is this sort of a gradual um, period of time that happened over many years um, where I, I'm just wondering, um, you know, where you had that, that ins the insights that have gotten you to where you are right now? Right. Um, so th there was a point in my life where I had, I think, did 14 and a half years in prison. I was released. Uh, to the halfway house. I, I enrolled in the college, was a straight A student. 
Um, and, you know, I had a five minute call with my mom and she was acting weird. I didn't really know what was going on. And when she hung the phone up, she wrote a letter and she committed suicide. And, and not just that, um, the halfway house decided that, you know, um, that they should send me back to prison for no reason. And not only did they send me back to prison, they put me on solitary confinement. Um, they took everything from me. They put me on a, a mental health unit where they were throwing feces and urine. And it was, it was the rock bottom for me. And I didn't even do anything to, to like warrant to be treated like this. But like in that, in that dark moment, and I think some of you guys mentioned this before, it's like when you're in circumstances like this, whatever's on the inside is going to come out. And all I kept thinking about, despite everything that was happening around me and to me physically, like mentally, I just kept thinking, like, I'm a good person. Like, I'm a good person. And so I'm not going to respond negatively about this. And so, uh, and I was upset about it. But, like, it just, something changed in me where it's like in moments like this, you just, you just got to show people what's on the inside. And so for me, it was like, I'm just going to respond to this in a positive way. And I'll get out of prison. Like, a year later, I was released. And I said, I'll just, I'll show through my actions. Like I'll, I'll be a good person in my community. I'll make sure I'm a good student. I'll be a good business person. And, and, that, and since that moment, it's just driven me like ever since. And so I just encourage people in like moments of like, you know, your rock bottom, just like find the positive aspect in it and just like show people what's in the inside. It's not always gonna be good stuff in the inside, but I just, I genuinely believe that people are inherently good. So you gotta just show people the goodness in the world, I think. And so that's what drives me. Amazing. Ethan, same question. Was there a uh, moment or a set of moments? Was there, was there a, a, did a light go off at some, a certain point or was this just um, a, sort of a more gradual process? I think there was, there's definitely something that happened. I didn't realize it at a time when I was 14 years old, cancer came into my home and it took my father away from me. And at that moment in my life, young kid, you know, I wanted to sit in my room, not come out and play, didn't want to talk to anyone, but it was my friends from soccer, my friends from school, um, family members, they're the ones that kind of literally reached out, embraced me, reinforced my values when a time when I felt like I was completely alone. So I think I learned at an early age the, 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 the benefit of community um, and being an integral part of the community. Um, took a major gap in that. And then when I was playing professional soccer, I played in the Zimbabwe Premier League and it was at the height of the HIV and AIDS pandemic. And a couple of my friends on the team got sick with HIV, kicked off the team, ostracized from the community, ended up living a horrible end of their life. So those two things combined, I think I was just sick of seeing people close to me die. <laughs> and uh, lucky enough, I was on Survivor and got the money and the platform. And so at that moment with Survivor and the money and the fame and deaths in my background and seeing my friends pass away, it was just the perfect things coming together for me to do something I had always wanted to do, which was help others and make sure other people don't die, really. Beautiful. Sam, thanks for asking the question. question. And I'm, I'm happy I did that because it's risky when you give control over to others, but definitely the right move. So Chris, either a question or an insight that you think people would benefit from hearing. I think I'll, I'll just provide some insight and sort of repeat what I said a little earlier. I, I want to just encourage people in this moment that we're going through, like it's so strange. Like I keep texting with my friends, like I can't believe we're actually living through this right now. We would read about like these pandemics that would come through every 50, 100 years um, in the world. But I would like to reiterate what I said about um, us all like using this moment as a reset moment and thinking about like what's really important to us. Who do we care about? Who are we as people and structuring this time to come out of this better than how we went into it? And so check in on our loved ones. Um, I'm a big believer in just like studying and self-improvement and like meditating and exercising and eating healthy. So I just wanna encourage everyone um, to, um, to think with a positive mind like this. And I'm also honored um, to be on this, this chat with, um, with everyone. So super happy about that. Really um, positive um, folks with amazing stories, so. And, and some people are gonna watch this on YouTube and others are gonna to listen to it on the podcast, but Chris has this big smile that's just so <laughs> contagious. Chris also, he mentioned being 118 pounds. Chris has big biceps and triceps yeah. now. Uh, yeah, there you go. Like, 
Uh, he's, not, he's not 118 pounds anymore. So I guess there are some benefits from being uh, in prison with, uh, with yourself. And so maybe that's one of the benefits. But Ethan, uh, a question or an insight that, that you'd want to share? Yes, I do have a question. I'd love to, because I'm often asked this question. All right, so I'm a, an everyday average person. Not that we're not all, but I wasn't in a horrible accident and get paralyzed. I wasn't in jail for 15 years. I didn't win a reality show and have cancer. Like I didn't have these things happen in my life, which helped me grow and learn and come out the other side to be an author or a speaker or on television. So what do you tell a person who's listening to this right now who didn't have this crazy, they're for the first time in their life, dealing with a pandemic this might be the most horrible thing that they've had to deal with in their life up until this point so what do you tell these people what's a word some words of wisdom and advice that you might want to give to people who hasn't been through a traumatic experience to grow from it that they can use in their life to get through this experience i guess i can start um so i would say like it's all relative right and so I get, I get, um, some people say this to me often. It's like, I haven't been through like half of the things you've been through or whatever, but again, like it's all relative. And I just would encourage, um, folks to, to think about people, you know, some of my friends have been complaining about stuff like, well, I like, I'm used to eating at this restaurant or whatever. I'm like, dude, like this is first world problems, right? <laughs> they're like folks who like lost their job, who just don't know what they're going to eat. And so I just encourage folks, I would say that, you know, there are people who don't, have almost anything and what can we do to be supportive of them whether it's um, words of encouragement whether it's connecting them to some resources like like stay be more involved that's the one thing uh one of you had mentioned earlier is like we're all doing this together right and so how are we going to perform like what are we going to do like and how are we going to contribute like i know folks that's doing all kinds of amazing stuff and anyone can do this doesn't matter what you've been through you can step up like right now like after watching this you can say you know what you know, I'm going to call my grandmother or I'm going I'm to call this, this potential mentee and set up calls where I can, like, encourage this person to stay positive through, like, these times that we're going through. So it's all kinds of things that we can do to be involved in making the world better and including ourselves. Right. I will echo what uh, Chris just said. And, um, you know, the way I see it is what's occurring right now is – probably something that we're going to start to see a whole lot more of. Maybe not necessarily in the sense of pandemics, but we are living in an age of disruption where we can start to probably expect that there are going to be disruptive things based on what's going on politically and what's going on with the environment. We should start to expect this type of thing on a semi-regular basis. And it might very well get worse. Now, the way that we have to deal with that is we have to first start to anticipate it and get that we can't be living through the same sort of expectations that we're going to have sort of, you know, the same job for the rest of one's, our lives. Like, you know, our parents' generation, you know, they could kind of have a job, set up a career and kind of expect that that career might last the rest of their lives. That type of thing is no longer going to be the case. And what we need to do right now, as I see it, is we need to, this is actually forcing us to look at ourselves and like forcing us to look at our values and look, and look at, okay, you know, really starting to live in that, by that maxim of be the change that you want to see in the world. Because if you can be the change you want to see in the world, then you are really living intentionally. And you can apply that to a whole lot of different avenues, a whole lot of different sort of ways of operating, a whole lot of different vocations. Like I don't necessarily have to be coaching. I could be taking my same mentality and applying it to poetry. I apply it to music when I play music because I also compose and produce and create music. So it's really about looking at okay, what are the values, what's coming through on, on, the, on the inside of what I would like to see the world look like? And how do I get into an alignment with that so that no matter what happens on the outside, no matter what disruption comes in, whether that's a pandemic or whether that's an entire industry that I'm working in that is suddenly no longer exists, 
expect the disruption and keep connecting with your values and your intentions so that you can navigate that disruption in a more graceful manner. And Ethan, I know I'm not uh, on the panel, but I'm going to just answer it as well because it's something that I've I've been asked. And I actually had a podcast guest who said, I've never been through any adversity. Like, I, I don't, maybe I need some in order to grow. And I, I just looked at him and I said, so first of all, um, if you haven't, you will. Uh, if you live long enough, you're going to face some shit. And that's just the reality. If you want to live a long life, you're going to lose a sibling. You're going to lose a parent. You're going to lose someone close to you or something traumatic is going to happen. Let's start there. Number two, if you have it, go reach out to your siblings, your aunt, your uncle, your best friend, whoever, because I will tell you, everybody's going through something. And I work with healthy people. People don't come to me because they're depressed or because they're anxious or because they've got a psychological disorder. They come to me because they want to get better. And those people tend to also have stuff um, because the human experience involves stuff. And so while it might not be as dramatic or as public as what you all have been through, their experience is their experience. And so if you haven't been through it, that doesn't mean you still can't be in service to those people that are close to you or strangers uh, and have empathy and, and compassion for, for what they're going through as well. And then the last thing I'll say is the biggest lie that we say is that I'm fine. Um, it's the biggest lie we tell people. It's the biggest lie that said is, how's your day or how's everything going? Oh, I'm good. Everything's yeah. okay. Right? Like we lie all the time when the reality is that a third of our population has anxiety or depression. And so like for me, the reason I'm doing this and I'm actually like getting a little choked up because this has been so meaningful for me hearing from all of you. The reason to do this is to serve and to help other people because I'm actually doing okay and I'm not lying right now. Uh, like I'm, I'm actually doing pretty good, but I know that some people that I'm close to are, are struggling with this and are really dealing with severe anxiety or depression and uh, they're going through something adverse right now or physically like they're they might be in the hospital with coronavirus like th this is real and and so having you all share your wisdom your experience your knowledge your hearts your souls um if it can help one person it's worth doing and so um that's how i think about your your question because i think a lot of people hear you guys and are in awe and i am one of those people as well i have not had a traumatic experience like the three of you had, but I've had my own stuff. And I'm thinking about how to leverage your insight um, every day and every moment. And I don't have to wait for something bad to happen to get better. I don't have to be sick to get better. Like I, I can continue to, to grow and develop. So with that, first of all, I just want to thank the three of you. Um, I've had incredible podcast guests on, but I said before, I think we fired up the mics. Like I am, I was super geeked to talk to all of you. And I, I lied to you. I said, we were going to go for an hour and I know <laughs> we've gone over, but sometimes you just have to feel it out. And, and to Sam's point, you just have to be in the present and, and see what magic happens. And this has been really magical listening to the three of you. And if I can ever bring you all together and get you in a room, I think it'll be even more powerful because while the remote stuff's cool, uh, I right. think we're all ready to also be in, in connection with each other physically um, in person. But what I'd love to end with is for each of you to promote something that you're either passionate about. I just want to say that all three of you also do speaking and um, you know, Sam mentioned coaching. Uh, the three of you are in service to our society in, in those ways. Ethan, I know you do a lot of public speaking. We talked about it before we recorded. Chris, um, I think one of the coolest things Chris is doing is he does speaking engagements uh, for companies and then has them buy his book to then send to inmates. And he's yes. on a mission to try to get his book into every prisoner's hands. And, you know, I don't think that was on your master plan originally, but I'm glad you've right. added it to your yes. master plan. And, and Sam was connected to me by a guy named Kyle Maynard. And, and Kyle is one of the deepest thinkers I know. And it's no, it's no surprise that Kyle and Sam have spent some time together uh, thinking deeply. And, and Sam is somebody who provides services to all kinds of fascinating people. So, with that in mind, I also want you to promote anything that you think deserves a megaphone. If people want to follow you on social media, where can they do that? I know people are going to finish watching this and listening to this and say, gosh, I want to learn more from Ethan, Chris, and Sam. And I know you're constantly 
trying to be in service to people. So Ethan, why don't you start and then we'll go to Chris and then we'll finish with Sam. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. It's been an honor to uh, hang out with you and share ideas and philosophies. And I'll finish with one of the quotes. Like I try to live my life today is by uh, living by the saying to never let a crisis go to waste because it's an opportunity to do some really important things. And I think we probably all feel that way or maybe we don't, but um, things I'm promoting, I don't know. Ethanzon.com uh, is my website. Uh, you can check me out on Instagram at Ethan Zahn. And for anyone who is really uh, suffering from anxiety, I am an investor in a huge hemp farm in Vermont called Mon Cush. And if you need a little CBD, uh, visit our website, moncush.com. And we're having a, uh, a sale right now. If you type in the code SURVIVOR50, you'll get 50% off. So there you go. Nice. Major right. plug right there. <laughs> <laughs> he went back into his promotional voice, just like we started. Right. I, I don't have a book, you know, oh, so like, hey, yeah. buy like some weed, I guess, is what I'm saying. Well, Ethan, when you read Chris's book, I can have you go on tour with Chris and you can open right. up. Right. Let's up do it. <laughs> you can open them up. Chris, go ahead. All right. All right, so um, of course I would like for everyone to read my book. It's The Master Plan. It's so everywhere books are sold. I also did the audio book in my voice. So those who don't like to read, you can um, hang out with me and hopefully everyone will read it and share it with folks and create your own master plan. I am still on a mission of getting my book into every prison in America. So I encourage folks to follow me on Instagram, Chris Wilson Baltimore, or go to my website, chriswilson.biz.biz. Um, and if you're interested in supporting uh, my mission, please reach out. Sam, take us home. <laughs> Great. Uh, I have a couple of offers. Um, for those who are interested in my uh, coaching program, they can uh, schedule a time to talk with me uh, at zenwarriorcoach.com. That's Z-E-N-W-A-R-R-I-O-R-C-O-A-C-H.com. Zen Warrior Coach. And um, I will also be offering uh, breath work uh, workshops online, uh, as well as um, uh, how to apply mindfulness and Zen philosophy to uh, using these times of disruption towards our benefit. And you can follow me for more information on that. Instagram is at Zen Warrior Training and um, Facebook.com slash Zen Warrior Training. And I just want to end by saying that there are a lot of people out there that promote themselves and the three men that are in front of you right now and that you're listening to are that you could feel like their awkwardness in, in sort of talking about it, but they are absolutely providing incredible insight and knowledge through their platforms and what they're doing. And I just appreciate all of your authenticity, uh, your stories, your willingness to share your vulnerability uh, in sharing some times that were, were real and were tough and, and difficult. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Brian Levinson, and we are going to roll out 10 more of these. So I'm doing 12 of these, and this is the second one. So if you found today's interesting, please check us out. I don't know the YouTube link. I've, I, I'm new to YouTube. We'll, we'll figure out where that is, but it'll be in the show notes. And guys, I just really, I want to thank you. Thank you all for, for also coming on the podcast. So if you want to learn more about each of the three of them, uh, each one came on the podcast and shared their story in, in more detail. And you can listen to those on intentionalperformers.com. Uh, fellas, good to see you. Good to connect with Likewise. you. Maybe we'll Bye, do guys. this again, Thanks not for during a crisis. Maybe right. we'll do it in person next time so we can right. touch and high five and stuff. Yeah. 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 So virtual high fives. There we go. All right, guys. Be well. Thank you, everyone. Right.